Good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, so we continue with our series of distinguished lecture series of the consortium. And we have a special event today. Uh, one of uh, the early, early organizers of IMSA and definitely the person who has contributed uh, most for the existence of this institute is going to be the distinguished speaker today. So let me lay on you a great uh, mathematician, humanitarian, and internationalist in more than one respect, uh, Ernesto Lopercio, who is going to tell us about orbifold stacks, stringing homologies, and localization. Ernesto? Thank you so much. I'm truly honored to, to give one of these consortium distinguished lecture series. And uh, this first lecture will be lighter. I hope you have uh, some fun with what I'm going to, the story that I'm going to tell you. I am going to uh, try to motivate stringy, cohomolo stringy cohomology, going all the way back to the origins of, um, of all before theory. Uh, so it's a bit historical, the talk, but I hope it's fun. Um, so this is the plan for the talk. Here, uh, first, here I will be speaking about orbifolds, uh, trying to explain what is an orbifold and giving some important examples. That's the first part. And then I will be in the search of the string homology, uh, and I will conclude the talk finally, defining string homology, motivated by all these examples and by all this history of the subject. So. Um, so what is an orbifold? Well, uh, quickly recall that a manifold is a space that is locally diffeomorphic to its hidden space. Uh, so that, uh, well, typically we, uh, we have this definition with charts and atlases. And then we require that the, that the map that goes from one chart to another uh, is a thin infinity map. So that's a smooth manifold. The critical condition is that it's local, diffeomorphic to its living space. Well, uh, and here's the point is that uh, these maps, phi, are one to one. So these, uh, these charts are uh, uh, an exact set of coordinates to every point in the manifolds. Uh, but uh, for an orbifold, uh, uh, this is uh, very similar, but it's slightly more uh, subtle in that at a point, if I have this an orbifold chart, this an orbifold chart, it, very, it looks very much like a manifold chart, except that a point would have many uh, pre images in it chart, many possible set of coordinates. And, uh, and I'm going to ask that uh, this chart uh, not, is not one-to-one -one anymore. It's not one-to-one. -one. But rather, is many-to-one. And I'm going to ask that the structure of this map that sends V to you uh, is exactly that of a quotient by a finite group. And, and now it gets a very uh, elaborate, the, the issue of uh, what one does when one has more than one child. Uh, uh, what is one to say about the the possible uh, maps that change from chart to chart? And this, uh, at first, one one would one could underestimate the problem and say, well, uh, this should be an easy thing to state. But it gets more and more complicated, surprising. 
and uh, more and, uh, and uh, while in the case of manifolds, uh, it's very easy to define what is a map from one manifold to another. It's infinite map, easy to define. Namely, it's not hard to define the category of smooth manifolds. But here, uh, it gets uh, extremely delicate the definition of a morphism of orbifolds. In fact, um, uh, there is at least five not uh, definitions that do not coincide. They are different definitions. And, um, and it, it was a little bit chaotic, the definition of a morphism of, of an orbifold for many years, which comes to show that it is a, a subtle notion. And now, why would one want to study orbifolds? Where is a natural generalization of the concept of a manifold? But I will give a, a beautiful example of an appli immediate application of this story that, um, that uh, it's very beautiful. It doesn't contain the word orbifold and it's a very classical and important theorem in geometry that uh, once one introduces the notion of orbifold, it's very easy, a theorem that is very easy to prove. But before one introduces the notion of an orbifold, it's very hard to prove. Yeah. So, but the first, let me give a typical example of an orbifold, a two dimensional orbifold. Uh, two dimensional orbifolds are uh, already interesting. Here we have two orbifold chars. This char uh, that, it, that has an action of a, 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 an action of a, the, the cyclic group in three elements, which I will denote by mu3. Uh, the, that is the three roots of unity. Well, I have this uh, action of this group and the quotient will be the chart here. And then I will also have a different uh, chart. Uh, this one is, is acted on by mu4. And now this will be the, this whole chart in the intersection, there is no ambiguity as to what it means uh, the transition because it's smooth, there is no uh, stabilizer. And uh, this is the, the so called threefold football. Uh, even here, uh, it's one has to be careful. A typical point here has three, four images here and three images here. Uh, and one has to be careful as to one, what one is doing. But this is an example, just the object, no morphism so far. And uh, well, uh, uh, this is a particular example of a more general example, but it's very important. There is an example of a weighted projective space. A weighted projective space is traditionally defined uh, as a generalization of the projective space. Uh, one takes the other sphere and acts by the circle via this form. One acts by the circle via the, this form. And uh, this is uh, this generalizes the Hopf vibration, where uh, all the lambdas for the ho classical Hopf. Uh, all the lambdas would be equal to one. And here I'm going to typically ask them to be relatively prime. It's not really necessary, but simplify things. They are integer numbers, positive integers. And uh, the, this is the way the weighted hop action of S1 on S3 looks like. We take the quotient. Uh, and now, now you may be asking, what does this have to do with all of us? Because I'm divided not by a finite group, but by a compactly group, a billion in this case. Uh, uh, well, the important point here is that by taking slices, uh, 
the same was happening when you when all the lambdas were one. In this case, you had to take different charts, and then you ended up with different charts gluing to classical projective space, complex projective space. And here the important part is that by taking a slices, one can construct this weighted projective space as a norm before we then plot one chart. The chart will be of the form a ball divided by a, a, a cyclic group, and a, it will be a billion. And a, in the case of two, a, in the case in which a, n equals one, you have two charts, and lambda one is equal to three, and lambda two is equal to, lambda zero is equal to three, and lambda one is equal to four, you get the three, four football. But this is a generalization, the weighted predictive space. And it is a norm. Uh, and we have to take these slices. Uh, and by slices, I mean, uh, well, this is of dimension, uh, this is of dimension 2n plus 1 and the dimension 1. So a true slice will be of dimension 2n acted on by a finite group. It will be a 2n dimensional ball acted on by a finite group, these are the slices. And uh, well, this happens more generally. Uh, given any compactly group uh, acting almost freely on any, say, compact manifold, uh, almost freely means that uh, at every point in the manifold, the stabilizer of the group action is a finite group. That's enough to obtain a notebook. Uh, with the underlying orbit space of the quotient space of M by gamma, but it has different orbital charts given by the various stabilizers of the, of the various local groups. Uh, uh, here, the local groups are all these new, and they are different, are a different chart. Uh, while there was a globally group acting, there is not a global finite group acting. This cannot be done. You cannot achieve this by a global finite group acting in the whole uh, manifold, in a whole manifold. So you will get various orbital charts for this quotient of a, one manifold by a compact group. Uh, whenever the, the action is almost, uh, almost free, all the stabilizers are fine. And this is a typical factory of uh, orbitals. This is a typical way to, to obtain orbitals. Uh, so this is the main factory of examples. Uh, not the only one. There is also uh, modular spaces, of course. And there is also uh, the next example. Uh, so I should I would like to say two remarks. First, the word orbifold is unusual, and this word was uh, voted during the famous Thurston seminar, for instance, in the seventies. He opened up a, a, an election for the name what an orbit what these spaces should be called, an orbifold one, and I was told. Uh, directly by Bill Browder that he proposed the name, Bill Browder, and then uh, uh, if I, uh, there were many proposals. Uh, 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 Thurston liked for many, et cetera, but all for one, and that's the origin of the war. Also, I like to say that early on in a letter from uh, Grothendieck to, to Sea, uh, Grothendieck uh, realizes that uh, the whole issue in the modular spaces of the, of the formation uh, could be solved essentially if you could understand what uh, the spaces that had these uh, groups, stabilizer groups attached to each one of the points. Uh, so it was noticed uh, very early in the in the 60s by Grothendieck. And of course, they were uh, motivated by arithmetics in the world of Sataki. He called them B-manifolds. They are not exactly the same. 
a level of generality, they are slightly less general than what we are going to call the multiple. And uh, uh, even in this case, it is conceivable that uh, we are going to allow, if this is the topological space where the various shards are occurring, X is just the topological space. X will be the overfall, X will be the topological space. Uh, well, uh, uh, we, we will allow in, in our, because of the construction that we will need in string cohomology and the like, we will allow that every point has a stabilizer. Every point, uh, point may have a stabilizer, even a generic point. Even a generic point. And this was not considered in the theory of Satake, but it was already understood by Groff. Okay. Uh, so uh, there is a beautiful example coming from the so called uh, 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 two dimensional crystallographic groups. or wallpaper groups, for sure. So this is the description of a wallpaper group that Wikipedia gives. A wallpaper is a drawing. This is a wallpaper, this kind of thing, that covers the whole Euclidean plane by repeating a motif indefinitely, in a manner that certain isometries script the drawing on change. It has an isometry group. Uh, and uh, to a given wallpaper, there corresponds a group of such congruent transformations uh, and this is the wallpaper group uh, or plain crystallographic group. Uh, and so this is uh, this, these groups uh, that can be defined in a precise manner using Euclidean geometry uh, are the mathematical avatar of these two dimensional repetitive patterns in R that are based on the symmetries of such patterns. And they, of course, occur frequently in architecture, decorative art, textiles, etc., and in all sorts of civilizations. This is, for example, one from Tahiri, and this one is from Dinidev in Assyria, and this one is uh, from porcelain in China. And every civilization uh, discovered many of these patterns over and over and over. They are intrinsic to the notion of art in human culture. Uh, and now, of course, we will have to speak about the number 17. Uh, there's a remarkable fact. Uh, there are exactly 17 uh, distinct such groups of planar symmetries. Exactly 17. Uh, this was proposed by Egraf Fedorov in 1891. And then derived independently by George Polia in 1924. Uh, and if you see the original proof of it's extremely complicated, you can download the paper. It uses Euclidean geometry and uh, enormous numbers of ad hoc, enormous number of ad hoc arguments. Polia's uh, proof that there are they, they are not proving that there are exactly 17. They are proving that there are at most 17 uh, of such patterns. And Polly approves this in 1924 by a more, much more organized, clever argument, still very elaborate and uh, slightly ad hoc, less than Fedorov's, but still uh, somewhat ad hoc in 1924. Uh, and so there are at most. Uh, 17 such groups, they prove, 1891. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the proof that the list of wallpaper groups is complete uh, came uh, only after the much harder case of uh, three dimensions, the much harder three dimensional case had been proved. Very funny, you know, the corresponding number. Uh, so, it was a hard thing to do to obtain this uh, 
uh, one thing is to prove that there is at most 17, and then you have to construct the 17 wallpaper patterns uh, that have uh, distinct groups, different, all of them in different groups. And these turn out to be hard. But of course, uh, uh, they could have uh, saved a lot of this effort uh, just visiting the Alhambra in Granada, Spain. Uh, because the proof of the theorem uh, of the existence of the 17 patterns was already in the Alhambra. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Uh, well, an echoism, uh, icon, an echoism, is the absence of material representations, icons, of both the natural and supernatural worlds in various cultures. And particularly, of course, in the monotheistic Abrahamic religions. Uh, and this anechoism, uh, this prohibition for the material representation of icons, uh, motivated uh, the development of very sophisticated decorative patterns in palaces such as the Alhambra in the south of Spain. Uh, the, uh, at the height of the of the Islamic culture in the south of Spain, uh, there is a beautiful story by Borges uh, related to the subject, of course. In any case, in the Alhambra, there is arabesque designs that decorate everything. If you go to the Alhambra, every mathematician should, the geometer should. Uh, and they decorate everything from the tiles and plaster work to wood carvings and lattice work in the windows with wood, you know, it's very nice. Uh, and I, I, I want to show pictures. I have many pictures of this. I, of course, with my pilgrimage to the Alhambra. And it turns out that, that all uh, 17 wallpaper planar crystallographic groups appear in the Alhambra. Uh, this is only one example, and there is hundreds of them, of course, many coincide, but all 17 appear in the Alhambra. Uh, this is an arabesque uh, from a wall in the Alhambra, and this is one of the P3 in, in the classical crystallographic notation. Uh, this is one of the groups. Uh, uh, so, uh, what does this have to do with all reforms, of course? Uh, well, uh, uh, the thing is that uh, the number 17 appears in the theory of all reforms as well. And this is very suspicious. Uh, this uh, told uh, Thurston, Thurston realized that uh, one could use all reforms to give an incredibly elegant uh, proof of uh, the 17 number theorem, that there is uh, on both sides, not only there are 17 such groups, but there are and construct the 17 uh, patterns using the theory of four holes in dimension two, recovering uh, all of them, all of the ones that appear in the lamp in particular. Uh, so, uh, uh, but this proof was kind of Folk until Conway kind of wrote it down in a more, in a more, it was part of the seminar in Thurston. And then Conway uh, uh, finally wrote this very, very famous paper, the Orbifold Notation for Surface Groups, uh, where he uh, gives this extremely nice notation that is not a, a, a identical to the crystallographic notation, actually much nicer. And uh, and then uh, he, he moreover uh, goes on and proves the theorem of the number seventeen. He says uh, uh, he starts with a being Conway Conway. Uh, he starts by this uh, quote: "Even quite ungainly objects like chairs and tables." Will become almost hysterical if you grab them in off this paper. And uh, the basic idea is that uh, it's a theory of covering spaces 
for all the false of dimension two, what will give you the, the, the result? I will try to explain. So, uh, but the basic idea is to define the orbifold Euler characteristic. And here one has to be extremely careful because the orbifold Euler characteristic, so if, if, if I have here a topological space that is, has an orbifold structure additional, is a topological space, but it is an orbifold once I give it its orbifold structure, I give it so called structure, etc. Uh, the thing is that the Euler characteristic of X is not the orbital Euler characteristic of X. This is a more subtle invariant. It's a topological invariant of the orbital, but it's a subtle invariant. Uh, that cannot be seen by the uh, topological course. It cannot be seen by the topological course. Uh, and of course, here you start seeing these sort of singularities. And one of the surprising properties, you start motivated by, a, by this problem of the crystallographic groups. And then a very subtle surprise that we will have tomorrow is that these is related to birational geometry. But so far, uh, we want to describe this solid characteristic. And well, here there is a formula. Uh, I, ca I can just define it by this formula. I take the manifold. Uh, let me just define it by a manifold modulo a finite group. And I could define it uh, more generally uh, for more general orbifolds. Uh, but in this case, let me just define it by this. Uh, uh, this is my topological space. And uh, it's orbital Euler characteristic. Uh, I'm the, by this straight X, I'm defining the, the orbital itself, not the quotient space, together with the orbital structure. Uh, is one over the order of G. And then I take the, uh, the subsets of uh, points in the manifold that are fixed by G and H. Uh, and so I take the Euler characteristics and I add up for every pair G comma H uh, in the group. And this is the definition of the Euler or for Euler characteristic. So there are several definitions. I could take this, that makes, uh, it's a very simple definition. I take all pairs that come mix. I take all pairs that come mute and I do this. And this is the orbital Euler characteristic that I was mentioning here. It's not the classical Euler characteristic, it's not. And uh, one could call it later on a stringy Euler characteristic. Because just uh, 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 was discovered by Dixon, Harvey, Buffa, and Whitney that it is a partition theory of a natural supersymmetric quantum field theory. That they singularizes the order. So it is, an, it is a partition function, but that's for the future. So far, this is just an, a definition, just a definition. And uh, Conway, early on, before it was known that it was the partition function of a supersymmetric quantum theory, or uh, 
many other things early, early on, from where the, the 70s. Uh, the, to give an, an intuition of what it means in the practice, how you go, would compute this in dimension two, uh, Conway explains in his paper that a vertex at a cone point, and say you have your orbital and you triangulate it, and you try the triangulation, you can always do that. You try your triangulation to be compatible with the stratification by stabilizers of the group action. You triangulate and then the, the vertices are in the fixed points and that kind of thing. And then a, a vertex at a cone point of order m counts at one over m of a vertex. And so you have this one of m, m of a vertex. A vertex at an ordinary boundary point, it could be orbitals with boundary, and this is important for the 17 number theorem, is a half of a vertex. And a vertex at a time, m corner point is one over two m of a vertex. Everything is very logic. An edge running along a boundary, it's a, a half of an edge, if you are in the boundary. And a phase with what John internal component is one M of a phase. You follow these rules and you compute this. It turns out that you get the orbital Euler characteristic of X. That, that clearly won't be the Euler characteristic of X because you are applying these rules. So these are the these are the most elementary way elementary way to describe the situation. This is the most elementary way to describe what the orbital Euler characteristic would look like. And it's very logical, one M of a vertex, a half of a vertex, one over two M of a vertex, a half of an edge. It has its logic, its internal logic. This is from Conway's original paper. And so now we will find 17 orbitals. Uh, so uh, again, here, uh, uh, we count if we have this cone acted on by mu n just two. This is one nth of a vertex, etc. Well, I could have done all the pictures, but I will do only this one. Okay. Uh, so now let's do the let's think of the universal cover of two-dimensional orbitals. Uh, what it, this should mean. Well, a two-dimensional compact connected orbital has either a hyperbolic structure, the orbital character, uh, Euler characteristic is less than zero, a parabolic structure if it is zero, Euclidean structure, parabolic structure, and if its Euler characteristic is positive, it's either bad, meaning that I cannot take just one final group to produce it, or has an elliptic structure. Uh, an orbital is called bad if, if the universal covering is not a manifold, but an orbital. But nearly all of these have a universal covering that are manifolds, except the bad ones. Uh, and so it, it is the same to say what I just said, that saying that the universal covering, whatever it is a manifold, is hyperbolic, Euclidean, or spheric, respect. And of course, crystallographic groups, if I take the symmetries and divide, I obtain an orbital. And of course, this orbital must be Euclidean. So it is the same to classify crystal, uh, two dimensional crystallographic groups, wallpaper groups, as Euclidean, two dimensional compact connected Euclidean orbitals. Uh, and there are exactly, uh, but now, uh, now you, you want to classify these orbitals. You triangulate them and you use the orbital Euler characteristic that has to be zero. And the restriction of the orbital Euler characteristic to be zero allows you to do very quickly, easily the classification. And you conclude that there are exactly 17 of these orbitals. And you construct the 17 orbitals by the triangulations and you recover all the wallpapers and the theorem of the, of the number 17. And now it's very easy. You're thinking on about orbitals and their covering spaces. Uh, 
So that's uh, that uh, that finishes this the section orbitals, and I will go uh, in the search of a stringy cohomology motivated by the uh, the the Euler characteristic that was able to prove the seventeen number theorem, the orbital Euler characteristic motivated by the orbital Euler characteristic. I will go in search of the cohomology theory that corresponds to this Euler characteristic. Well, of course, ordinary cohomology corresponds to ordinary uh, Euler characteristic. And now I wonder which cohomology? Well, it, it will be called stringy because of the time where it was discovered. Which cohomology corresponds to the orbital Euler characteristic? Yeah. We are in search of this cohomology. So we're in the search of the cohomology theory that corresponds to the orbital Euler characteristic. It is useful to think of orbitals as groupoids, as stacks, yeah. Uh, sheaves of groupoids. I just will give you the global uh, object, the groupoid. Uh, and uh, I will go a little bit deeper into this early tomorrow. But right now, uh, I will just very quickly say that we will interpret an orbital. Uh, to, to remember its orbital structure and not be talking about these charts all the time and it's complicated. I will encode all this information in a category uh, whose objects are the points of the manifold. These are the objects of the category. So the objects of the category, now called X0, are the points of your manifold where the group, finite group is active. Uh, and I remember that the objects are smooth manifolds. So it's a it's a category enriched in smooth manifolds. Uh, now the arrows of the category, so while the objects of the category are the points M and M, the arrows of the category, the morphisms of the category are the pairs M G. Uh, where M is in M and G is in G. G is a finite group acting on M. And uh, so this is what a typical, uh, and now from now on, I will be acting on the left. It is a little bit nicer notation. Uh, this is a typical arrow on the category. It's a pair XG sending X to XG. X and XG are objects because they are elements of M. And the composition of R well, looks like this. You use the product in the group and then and the action. And this is a typical uh, commutative triangle. OK, so we have this category. Uh, so we will think of an orbital as this category. Actually, it's a groupoid. Because every arrow has an inverse. Uh, the inverse of XG is, of course, XG to G minus one. Uh, this is the inverse of XG. And, uh, and this is, every arrow has an inverse. So it's a group pole. It's a category where every arrow has an inverse, the pole. Now, uh, it is a classical construction to do the so-called homotopy quotient of this group action, orbital construction, or classifying the space of the category. So let me talk about classifying spaces. Uh, the, these reflect the, the, the most naive type of homotopy type of this stack or this group poly, uh, of this category. You know, the stack is a sort of group category, sort of group point. And then, uh, well, the classifying space uh, is called the X. 
call it classified space. Uh, and uh, it will be an infinite dimensional topological space. Uh, and well, you know, how this is constructed is constructed inductively. We start by drawing a graph. The vertices of the graph are the points again in M. Remember, X0 is the objects, it's M, is the objects of the category. Uh, and we remember the topology of the space of objects. And then we draw an edge for every arrow. So if we have here the objects, zero, and now we have X and then XG, and then we have X comma G. To every pair X comma G, we draw an, a one simplex and we attach this one simplex here. Uh, and now, uh, well, if we have X and then we have XG, and then we have X, G, H, we attach here one simplex, we attach here one simplex. These are three points in the objects. In M, that is X0, that is the objects. And then I attach a simplex here, a simplex here, and a simplex here. And, uh, well, now I attach a two simplex whenever I have a pair of G and H, and so on. If I have G, H, and K, I attach a three simplex. X, this uh, G sends it here, H sends it here, and K sends it here. Then I attach this three simplex, and I construct this huge topological space. Uh, uh, that Seagal proposed in 1968. And uh, it's a huge topological space, it's called BX and simple. In particular, uh, uh, BX has a map to the quotient space, M of G, just a topological space. And the inverse image at every point here is uh, the classifying space of the stabilizer of the action. Uh, so you can imagine here the quotient space, X, and at every point you have this kind of, uh, well, vibration, not a vibration, but you have all these classifying spaces uh, above every point of X. And that's how the classifying space of the old fold looks like. I will stop one second to ask if there is any questions so far. Well, no question so far, very, very good. Uh, so uh, this is equivalent to the so-called classical Borel construction. Uh, in any case, it, it's, a very, it's already a very important example, G acting on a point. These are funny orbifolds, but it's an important orbifold because it sends the category of groups fully faithfully inside the category of orbifolds. This was impossible with the classical Sataki definitions and so far, you could not put inside the category of groups inside the category of orbitals, but with the definition that I propose, you can, of course, it's obvious. And uh, uh, in this case, well, of course, the classifying space of the orbital becomes the classifying, classical classifying space of the group that classifies principal G bundles over, over any other uh, compactly generated topological space. Uh, so the set of homotopy classes from Y to BG is the principal G bundles over Y. And this is the classical interpretation of the classifying space of G. In this uh, case in which the, uh, the, the quotient space X, in the case in the quotient space is just a point. Uh, now, uh, when X is M of G, it is customary to write rather than the X, M, G cross E, G. Uh, because of this theorem of Steinroth, saying that this is the same as having M cross E, G, where E, G is a free uh, contractible G space, and then dividing by G. 
e, initialization of steam door. And, uh, uh, and this is the classical bottle construction. And, uh, and one would ask in a general, in a general orbital, what am I classifying with this classifying space? And it's an elaborate answer. Uh, it's a, it's a shifified version, a stackified version of BG. And uh, Ikemoda has described in, in his book, uh, what the BX classifies. It's an elaborate answer. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, you could say, well, but if I change the, the group point that represents X, equivalently changing the orbital atlas, I could have different orbital atlases for X. And each one of these orbital atlas corresponds to one of these group points uh, representing X. So many group points represent the same X, uh, just as many atlases represent the same many. And BX seems to depend on what groupoid I chose for representing X. And it does, literally, as a topological space, but uh, not its homotopy type. Uh, BX really, BX is, uh, when I write BX, I don't really mean a topological space. I mean only the topology, the homotopy type of a topological space. So as a homotopy type, it is well defined. And that's another important observation. In any case, uh, I was in search of a string homology and I took quite a detour. A hope would be that the cohomology, that the characteristic Euler of BX, the Euler characteristic of BX, would be the orbital Euler characteristic of X. But this is false. Uh, B, BX doesn't quite do it. And what does this mean in terms of, of the search of the cohomology? Well, and the obvious reason why this is, is not the case is that this is a rational number and this is always an integer number. And so it cannot possibly be true. This is always an integer number. So it's, I seem to be hopeless here. Uh, well, uh, 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 I could try to correct by dividing by G or something, but it won't work in this case. Even if I divide by the order of G or anything like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is an interior, this is a situation. I'm looking for the, the cohomology theory that gives me the appropriate Euler characteristic. Uh, and then, well, equivalent cohomology won't quite do it. This is an integral thing, etc. Uh, this is what it means that, in, uh, that, the, that the obvious candidate, the equivalent cohomology, is not a stringy cohomology. So the, the upshot of all this story is that this is not the stringy cohomology that I'm looking for. It's not equivalent cohomology. You know, the classical theory of equivalent cohomology doesn't give me the string cohomology I am looking for. Uh, 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 in the case of a point, it's an interesting, let's see what's going on. Uh, so let's ser search for the correct uh, cohomology theory because I just, uh, all this discussion was just to show that it wasn't equivalent cohomology. So, uh, I take this again, the point I'm trying to guide my situation. I have a formula for this. I apply the formula for this. MGH in this case is always a point, it's always one. Uh, so if I apply the formula, uh, well, it becomes the number of pairs of commuter elements of G because I, I was adding over all such pairs divided by the order of G. It's amusing but true to show exercise that this number of pairs commuter elements in G divided by G is the same as the number of conjugacy classes of G. And now this brings memories in us of representation theory. And it's saying that somehow this is not directly related to equivalent cohomology, but maybe it is directly related to representation theory. 
So, uh, well, indeed, given a finite group, there are two basic quantities that we can consider. It's group cohomology, and this fails to be stringy cohomology of the, of the stack. This fails. Uh, I, I'm, I'm first trying to understand what a stringy cohomology of the stack point mod G. And it failed to be a equivalent cohomology. But what about its representation ring? Uh, uh, well, what if I consider equivariant K theory rather than equivariant cohomology? Uh, here, the representation ring is, of course, very related to the number of conjugacy classes in the group. And now, what if I take equivariant cohomology that is just the same as the representation ring in this one case? Could I, could I find a stringy cohomology? Well, uh, well, as a first test, it has to be an invariant of the orbifold, not of the particular representation of the orbifold as a, as a manifold modular finite group. There is, it's easy to show that there is very different manifolds and very different finite groups whose quotients give the same orbit. Uh, and uh, one can show, uh, using the classical resource of Siegel and equivalent cohomology, that indeed uh, this is the, uh, this would have the same equivariant K theory. And so all uh, the it's 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 one should be allowed to call all before K theory the equivalent cohomology of any of its representations. It depends only on the orbifold and not on the particular way to represent it. Uh, and now we want to recover the orbifold Euler characteristic from equivalent K theory. Uh, Atiyah Seagal, as soon as they saw this paper of Dixon, Harvey, Duff, and Witten, realized that this could be done. And they published this paper where uh, they do it. And they do it in a slightly different way that I will do it today. Uh, but uh, one could do it in the following way. That is, use the Seagal character of an equivariant vector. This is not exactly how they do it in their paper, uh, but it can be done like this. So what is the Seagal character? Well, uh, the basic cycles of equivariant K theory are G equivariant vector bundles. Uh, so bundles over a G manifold with a G action uh, by bundle automorphism that extends the action of a M, consider the zero section. Uh, and uh, 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 and there is fiber wise linear so vector bundles. Uh, so they, they can have zero sections. They are not principal bundles, but vector bundles. And then uh, if there is a fixed point, for example, on the manifold, and these are important points for all, there are the singularities of the orbifold. They correspond to the singular locus of the orbifold. Then uh, notice that the fiber becomes a representation of the stabilizer. Uh, it should say here G of M. The, the group that fixes it. Uh, if it was fixed for all of G, yes, indeed it would be of all of G. Uh, uh, and, and in particular, when M is a point, well, it's indeed all of G, it fixes everything. And it is the same to have an equivalent vector bundle then than a representation of G. So, uh, so these are the generalizations of the representations of the group for all equivalent vector bundles over M. And this is an orbital notion, an equivariant vector over of bundle over M with the correct morphisms and not with the Sakataki morphism will move to any representation by any manifold by any group. And there will be a corresponding equivariant vector bundle. It's a good orbital notion. These are the orbital vector bundles. And now we can give this marvel formula, uh, the, the Seagal character of an equivariant vector bundle. If I take an equivariant vector bundle, I can get its character just, just like when I had a representation, I could get its character. Now, if I have an equivariant vector bundle, I can get its character. And it will go over, of course, uh, just like a representation. The character was a function, a class function, you know, 
on the a function on the on the conjugacy classes of the group. Now it will be a, a sum over the conjugacy classes of the group of a vector bundle over the fixed points for that G, but it's stackified by the correct uh, stacky object. And here I would like to say that it's time to say that the union over G of MG mod CG, it's called the twisted sectors of, of the object. So the twisted sector first appear in the Seagull character formula for an equivariant vector bundle over M. And what is this formula? Well, uh, if I have an equivariant vector bundle, I, uh, the, its character at the conjugacy class G, at the conjugacy class G, is the sum of all roots of unity of the Z eigenspace, eigen uh, the space of G and then G is the, so the space of fixed points. So I reset E to the fixed points and then I take uh, the, the, uh, this uh, root of unity of the order of G and I take its eigen bundle and I tensor by the root of unity. And this is, this generalizes a classical character formula in representation theory and gives you this isomorphism of the equivariant K theory, tensor of the complex number, with the K theory of the twisted sectors, tensor of the complex number. And this is the so called Seagull localization property. So, uh, so it, now it's not, it is no longer, this is ordinary K theory, this is no longer equivariant K theory. But now it leaps over the twisted sectors. Now it leaps over the twisted sectors. And so it lost all torsion phenomena. Uh, uh, well, this recovers the usual theory of characters for a finite dimensional representation of a finite group. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm about to finish, give me two minutes. Uh, from Seagull's isomorphism, we conclude that uh, we got uh, uh, the correct uh, Euler characteristic. So, uh, so we get uh, this, uh, this Euler, the orbital Euler characteristic arises from KTA. Uh, and using this and the Seagull localization formula, now we motivate our definition. It gets us the right Euler characteristic. It gets us finally the right Euler characteristic. And because equivariant K theory no longer equivariant has a churn character to cohomology. This all, of course has only even a not grading, but now I can grade it. And I will talk about the grading carefully tomorrow, but now we finally got uh, this uh, place where the correct channel character has to land. And this is, has the correct Euler characteristic, the orbital Euler characteristic of Conway and Thurston. And it is compatible with non-commutative geometry. Uh, it is, uh, it is isomorphic to the Hochschild homology of the adequate category, uh, the periodic cyclic homology of the adequate category, uh, and it has the correct partition function for a quantum field theory that we will describe tomorrow. Uh, so this is finally we encountered the stringy cohomology, and we will use this cohomology, uh, the, 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 the structures and the and this localization principle, we we'll use this localization principle in motivic, in motivic cohomology to obtain some nice results in birational geometry. But that will happen tomorrow. And I have finished today.
Any questions? Any questions? Uh, hello, may I ask you a question? Of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, so in your the definition of the uh, world of perspective, so you assume that I think uh, it's, uh, X is M mod G where G is finite. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it is, you know, as you, as you told, usually this is a manifold quotient regroup. So can he, in that case, how can he define this all characteristic? Yeah, uh, let me tell you. I'll, I'll do it in a second. I have a space here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, after I, everything that I have said, after everything that I have said, yeah. uh, well, uh, I was taking this groupoid, this category, where these were the, the objects, the arrows, and this was X1, and this was X2, and it was a groupoid. Yes, yes. And tomorrow, I will just take any groupoid, any group point, so that the uh, so that the if this is the source and the target of the group point, uh, if I take uh, if I take every point a point typical point here, I can still define its stabilizer. Uh, it's the stabilizer of the group point, the stabilizer of M, using this group point, not this one anymore. The stabilizer of them are the arrows that go from M to M. Uh -huh, yeah. And it is a group. It is a group. It's the stabilizer group of them. And essentially, if this is finite. I will say that the action of the group point is almost free. Just like for a Lie group acting on a matrix, remember? Yeah. Well, I will also say here that it's almost free. And there will also be a slice theorem. And then yeah. the, the quotient will still be an orbital. And now I can define the inertia stack of the orbital uh, in the obvious way. Uh, this is will be, morally speaking, will be home from Z to the group point X. Mm. This is the same uh, for a group. If I take home from Z to G, this is the same as the union of uh, conjugacy classes of G. Is the conjugacy class of G? Uh, so this will be if it does, if this group point was a global quotient like this, the I of X in this example here, the I of X would be the union of MG would be the twisted sectors. The, the target of the Seagull character formula. So in general, this will be the twisted sectors. And then the string homology, the correct the string homology that gives you the correct thing for many uses that I was describing will be the cohomology of the twisted sectors in general. But I will say this a little bit better tomorrow. I see, but I mean- wait, wait. You will repeat this tomorrow, Ernesto? I will, I will say this in a much more, uh, yeah, a clean way tomorrow. Okay, okay, then I'll, I'll wait till tomorrow with the questions, okay. I see, but can I anyway compute this 
or a characteristic for this uh, M mod gamma when M and M is so many for and gamma is little by kind of uh, gluing this uh, local or a characteristic. Is it? I mean, can I compute this uh, or a characteristic? For this global quotient by Lie group by computing this local or local statistic. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you have uh, the only the, the characteristic once you do it here, once you do it here in the three sectors, yeah, will have the uh, motivic property. We have the, the usual motivic structure. And uh, and then uh, yeah, it will be one. We'll, in fact, we will do, be doing it in, uh, as a morphism from the motivic ring to the integer. So yeah, you just do the local calculations. And you can add them up by an exclusion, inclusion, exclusion principle. But you have to be working on the inertial stack of the stack. Oh. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? All right, let's thank Ernesto for the, for the wonderful lecture today. And uh, so we proceed uh, at the same time tomorrow, tomorrow at uh, noon Miami time. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank See you. you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yeah.